Hello YouTube, in this series we'll be looking at some of the major developments in philosophy of science. Obviously philosophy of science is a very diverse field, so um, I better say a little about where I intend to go with this series. Uh, science has made enormous progress. We seem to understand the world far better today than we did you know, 300 years ago. We have incredible abilities to control and manipulate nature, and we've been able to make uh, massive improvements to human lives as a result. Uh, now this is almost entirely because of science. So the question naturally arises, how exactly has science achieved this? What, what is it about science that allows it to exhibit this power? I guess one way to put this is, what is the scientific method? This is the sort of thing we'll be looking at. So today we'll be uh, considering the nature of confirmation. Um, one of the, the central features of science is that it generates theories and it tests those theories by making observations. Certain observations seem to uh, support or confirm theories. So how do we relate uh, observations to theory? Uh, in this video and the next, I'm going to examine two proposed methods, the naive inductivist method and the hypothetico-deductive method. Uh, I'm starting with these because I think these ideas quite closely match what the average person has in mind when they think of the scientific method. So uh, yeah, they, they, they seem a good place to begin. Now before considering these methods uh, it's maybe worth noting a, a general point about different kinds of inference. Uh, first there is deductive inference or deduction. Uh, in a deductive inference the, uh, the, the, the truth of the conclusion is guaranteed. Uh, so if, if the premises are true, the conclusion must be true. Uh, the classic example is, all men are mortal, Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal. Right? If, if the premises of this argument are true, the conclusion must be true. It cannot fail to be true. There's no possible way that the premises could be true and the conclusion false. It would just be contradictory. Right? You, you can't even imagine a situation in which these premises are true and the conclusion is false. Now, the important thing to notice about deduction is that it is uh, non-ampliative. This means that the conclusion does not contain any more information than was in the premises. The conclusion just makes salient some of the information that you already asserted when you asserted the premises. And, uh, I mean, that's, that's, why the, the, that's why the truth of the premises guarantees the truth of the conclusion, right? Because... Uh, in asserting the conclusion, you're just basically reasserting something that you already said when you said the premises. So, you know, if, if the premises are true, the conclusion has to be true as well. Um, and, and so deduction is, is any kind of inference where the truth of the conclusion is guaranteed by the truth of the premises. Now, deduction is, is very important, uh, obviously in you know, logic and mathematics and so on but it doesn't seem to be very central to the sciences. Science teaches us new things about the world, and that's not something you get with deduction. With, with deduction, right, you, you can't learn anything new, you can't learn any new facts, right? So science instead appeals to certain uh, non-deductive uh, or inductive inferences, uh, or induction. Uh, the, the classic examples of induction are inferences like uh, all observed swans have been white, therefore all swans are white. Or maybe we might say you know, all observed swans have been white, therefore the next swan I observe will be white. Um, in, in this case, the premises do not entail the conclusion. They don't guarantee the truth of the conclusion. We're saying, well, you know, swan number one is white, swan number two is white, swan number three is white, and so on. No matter how many swans we observe, it's possible, it's imaginable, that the next swan we observe will be black. Uh, the claim that all swans are white goes beyond what is asserted in the claim that all observed swans are white. No matter, no matter how many we observe, it's possible that, uh, that the next will be black. Uh, and as a matter of fact, there are black swans uh, native to New Zealand. So all, all the swans up to, you know, I don't know, 1500 or whenever, all of the ones that Europeans had observed were white, and perhaps they concluded that all swans were white, but they were actually mistaken about that. So, uh, in the case of an inductive inference, the truth of the conclusion is not guaranteed. 
And this kind of reasoning does seem to be used in science. So we will reason, uh, you know, all uh, previous observed objects have obeyed Newton's laws of motion, therefore all objects obey Newton's laws of motion. Uh, obviously inferences in science are, are usually more complex than this, but the point is that science involves making generalizations that go beyond the immediate observable evidence. Um, I mean, indeed, the very concept of a law of motion, uh, you know, as, as something that applies to the universe as a whole, well, that obviously relies on induction, because you, you don't observe everything that's going on in the entire universe. So we expect that nature is somewhat uniform, and, and, and so we think we can generalize from the observations we make. Now, uh, throughout this series, I'm going to use the term induction to cover all forms of non-deductive inference. Uh, there are different types of induction. The example just presented with the swans is an example of enumerative induction. So with an enumerative induction, we reason from the premise that all observed Fs are Gs to the conclusion that all Fs are Gs. However, science also appeals to what's known as inference to the best explanation. On this form of inference, uh, we say that X is the best explanation for some phenomenon, therefore X is true. For example, 65 million years ago, dinosaurs went extinct. Uh, you know, we might wonder why they went extinct. We also fa find uh, that there are high levels of the element known as iridium in layers of the crust that are dated to about 65 million years ago. Now, uh, we know that asteroid impact can cause both extinction events and high levels of iridium, since asteroids contain much more iridium than the Earth's crust. So it looks like we have an explanation of these seemingly unrelated facts. Right, 65 million years ago, an asteroid struck the Earth, and that caused the dinosaur extinction, and it caused the high levels of iridium to be deposited in, into the crust. So the, the best explanation of the facts is an asteroid impact 65 million years ago. And because this is the best explanation, this is what we should believe happened. Uh, inference to the best explanation is sometimes considered to be separate from both deduction and induction. It's sometimes called abduction. Uh, as I said, I'll be using the term induction to cover all of these non-deductive inferences. Uh, the, the, the crucial point to see is that scientific inferences are ampliative. When we make inferences in science, we go beyond what is contained in the premises. Uh, so you know, science isn't just like a, a, a list of observations and you know then sort of rephrasing these observations in various ways. We Rather, we make observations and then we use these observations to defend broader conclusions, conclusions about you know what cannot be observed or conclusions about what might be observed but hasn't yet been observed. Science you know, goes, goes beyond the evidence. Uh, so, um, so with that in, in mind, uh, uh, we can maybe try to sort of uh, specify how, the, how, how we do this, how it is that we go beyond the evidence. How does, this, how does the scientific method work? Well, first of all, we'll consider naive inductivism. This is usually associated with uh, the philosopher Francis Bacon, uh, although I should note that actually Bacon probably wasn't a naive inductivist. His own views were uh, rather more sophisticated, but it's sort of become associated with him. Uh, so naive inductivism involves three steps. First of all, we observe and record as many facts as possible associated with the phenomenon we are studying. Ideally, we would want to record all the facts, although, of course, in practice, um, you can't do that. In making these observations, we have to try to be as neutral as possible and you're not to assume any prior theory. We just record what we, we see, hear, feel, or what our measuring instruments report. Um, obviously, it's better to rely on measuring instruments because they're more accurate than the sensors. Uh, now, bear in mind that this, this is not just a matter of making passive observation, but it also involves setting up experiments. Uh, experiments are important because they allow us to see what happens in conditions that we don't normally encounter. So they allow, you know, experiments allow us to construct conditions that are, uh, that are relatively unusual, uh, and, and so that provides us with uh, novel observations. Uh, as Bacon put it, experiment allows us to uh, torture nature for her secrets. So that's the first step, making many observations. The second step is 
you know, once we've observed these very many facts, we then analyze these facts and we try to classify them in some coherent way. Now for Bacon, this involved uh, sorting facts into various tables. So if we're studying heat, we might draw up tables of all the things we observe that are hot, all the things we observe that are not hot. And then we would need a table comparing the amount of heat that different things have. Again, we're not assuming any prior theory here. We're simply listing uh, instances of the you know, presence or absence of various properties. Uh, third step is to draw generalizations from uh, these facts that we have observed and classified. So we, we study all the facts that we've laid down and we might ask, well, you know, what other properties are present or what else happens when heat is present? And you know, what properties are absent or what never happens when heat is absent? And this allows us to make generalizations about heat. We can then derive predictions from these generalizations and test those predictions. So uh, let's take an example. Suppose we're interested in studying human life expectancy and the things that reduce it. Well, first we uh, observe humans and record as many facts about them as possible. Uh, second, we, we classify the data. We might classify some people as smokers and some as non-smokers. Uh, we might classify them on the basis of whether they develop lung cancer. Of course, we will classify them in various other ways as well, but you know, these two are salient here. So th third, we, draw the in we, we use induction to draw generalization. We immediately notice that people who smoke seem to have higher rates of lung cancer, which leads to the hypothesis that smoking causes cancer. And uh, we can come up with various ways to test this hypothesis. So put simply, you start by building a collection of numerous observations in an unbiased way, and then you make inductive generalizations from those observations. And, and the focus here is on the collection of observations. Provided you've collected observations in a good way, uh, and provided that the generalizations you make are based upon those observations, your inquiry should reach good conclusions. The crucial point is that you're not to start out with preconceived ideas about which facts are important. You simply collect the facts. If you start out with a, a kind of preconceived theory, the worry is that you will tend to just look for facts that fit the theory and ignore those facts that don't fit the theory. So the objectivity of science uh, requires that we make neutral collections of observations. Uh, in, in this respect, Bacon was uh, concerned to avoid what he called the idols of the mind. So it's very easy to fall into errors. Many things can interfere with good reasoning, and, and these are the idols of the mind, uh, of which Bacon identified four. First, there are the idols of the tribe. This refers to our tendency to assume that there is more order and regularity in nature than in fact there is. Uh, James Ladyman, uh, in his Introduction to Philosophy of Science, gives the example of uh, the, the tendency of past scientists to assume that the planets orbit in perfect circles. Actually, the orbits trace ellipses. Uh, this error involves sort of you know, seeing particular kinds of patterns that aren't there. It's very easy when we look at any set of data to project onto it patterns that aren't real. Second, there are the idols of the cave. This refers to those errors that arise due to particular individual preferences or particular life experiences that bias our interpretation of phenomena. Some people are uh, more radical, some are more conservative, and this prejudices how they see the world. Different people have different educational backgrounds or different interests, uh, and this can introduce biases as well. Third, the idols of the market. Uh, these are confusions caused by the peculiarities and imprecisions of language. So think about the word bank. Well, this can refer to a financial institution or to the land alongside a river. Uh, this kind of obvious homophone is unlikely to cause confusion. But uh, other words are more slippery. Words like love and energy are used in subtly different ways in different contexts. There's a difference between the love I have for my girlfriend and the love parents have for their children, although there's also commonalities. And so if you're trying to study the nature of love, say, uh, you are liable to be misled. 
Finally, the uh, idols of the theatre. Uh, this involves accepting, uh, without criticism, uh, philosophical dogmas and uh, mistaken methods of study. Scholarly people can have a tendency to become attached to particular philosophical or scientific systems, uh, and these can be misleading. So by emphasising the importance of first collecting many observations and then uh, reasoning inductively from these observations, the naive inductivist method is designed to uh, avoid pitfalls such as these. Uh, now, this might seem like a, an intuitively appealing sort of method, uh, but it, it faces a number of problems. Uh, these are discussed in some detail by Carl Hempel in his book Philosophy of Natural Science, which is uh, available online. First of all, the first step of the method requires us to build a collection of facts, uh, and in a kind of unbiased way. But there are an infinite number of facts. How do we know which facts are relevant? The concern here is that uh, trying simply to collect facts in, in this kind of neutral, unbiased way will lead to all sorts of pointless observations. Charles Darwin uh, made this point when he said of this method, uh, one might as well go into a gravel pit and count the pebbles and describe their colours. Uh, Darwin continues, he says, all observation must be for or against some view if it is to be of any service. Uh, even if you have specified a particular problem that you want to solve, until you have some hypothesis in mind, you don't know what the relevant data is. So let's say we want to know, for example, what causes plague. Plague is a disease that afflicts humans. So, uh, you know, what, what do we do? Well, uh, you know, do we just make a collection of every observation we can about humans? I mean, should we collect data about the number of hairs on each individual's arm? The inductivist requires us to collect data blind, but science could never get started if we adopted this approach. We need to have a hypothesis in mind that we either want to support or to refute, and then we use this to guide our observations. Wholly unbiased observation, even if it were possible, uh, doesn't seem like it would be especially helpful. Uh, as Hempel says, the sorts of data that it's reasonable to collect is determined uh, not by um, just a, a general problem that we want to solve, but by a suggested answer to that problem. So if I suggest that plague is caused by eating rotten apples, well now you know what to look for. We can check plague victims and, and check if they'd eaten rotten apples before contracting the plague. Um, or, or maybe we get a number of participants who agree not to eat any apples and see if this prevents them from contracting plague. But you first need to have that, kind, that, that suggested answer in mind before you look for the data. A similar problem afflicts the second step, which requires us to analyse and classify data in an unbiased way. The problem is that a set of facts can be analysed in a number of ways, and most of those ways will be uh, irrelevant to our inquiry. As suggested before, we might classify people based on the number of hairs on their arm, uh, or based on their current distance from London, or based on their favourite colour, or based on the length of their fingernails, and so on. For most purposes, uh, these classifications would be utterly irrelevant. So, yeah, I mean, and, and actually quite often, the types of classification that are relevant are quite surprising. So in terms of understanding plague, it turns out that a very important factor is how close people are to rodent populations. We only know that this is relevant because we assume that plague is caused by bacteria spread from fleas on rodents. Um, you know, if, if, if we were to classify facts in a purely neutral manner, well, you probably wouldn't pick up on... That, you, know, you probably wouldn't pick up that proximity to rodent populations is something that's, that's relevant. A third problem uh, concerning observations is that some observations are untrustworthy. The classic example is that if you put a stick in water, it will appear bent. If we're simply reporting and classifying observations in a completely neutral way, well, do we say that we observe a bent stick? Now, this is particularly difficult in, with respect to the sciences because uh, we might be using sophisticated instruments that can go wrong in all sorts of ways. So think about microscopes. Samples of what you want to look at have to be prepared correctly before they can be viewed under a microscope. Uh, if they're not prepared the right way, then you, know, you won't see them properly. Uh, similarly, there might be uh, alignment problems with the microscope itself, which can cause the image to be doubled or you know, it can cause the image to be blurred and hazy. 
Uh, image distortion can also be caused by contamination of the internal optics, which will make the image dull and hazy. The point is that when collecting observations, we need to know what observations we, uh, you know, which observations we dis which we trust and which observations we should discount, and making this judgment relies on some prior theories. Right? We have prior theories in mind about what uh, about the conditions under which um, observations are trustworthy. A fourth problem arises with how exactly we are supposed to derive theories from observations. So the naive inductivist says, well, you make a collection of various observations, you, uh, you, you then you know, classify the, the facts that you've observed, and, and then you, you, you use those facts and draw a theory from them. Now, philosophers have, uh, uh, for a while now, drawn a distinction between two types of terms in, uh, in, that are used in science. There are observational terms and theoretical terms. The observational terms simply describe what we immediately encounter in the world. Cars, mountains, sky, lightning, water. In science labs, we talk about cloud chambers, microscopes, pressure gauges, thermometers, particle accelerators. You know, these are the things that we uh, that, that, that we just observe and you know we work with and you can pick them up and look through them and touch them and manipulate them and so on. Now, the thing to notice is that scientific theories are couched in terms that do not occur in the description of observations, and these are the theoretical terms. Uh, so, so terms uh, like uh, you know beta particle, neutron intermolecular force, psi function, photon. We never observe uh, beta particles or neutrons or intermolecular forces. So, so the point is that if you stick to generalizations that don't go uh, beyond the brute observations, you know, so you, you observe the facts and uh, classify the facts in a neutral way and then just draw generalizations straight from these facts, well, how could you ever develop a theory that involves reference to things that are never observed, that are not part of you know, the facts that you list? So the, the, the observations might be tracks in cloud chambers, whereas the theory talks about you know, beta particles. Beta particles are never observed. Nowhere in the description of the data from the cloud chamber does the term beta particle appear. Indeed, the term beta particle does not appear in the description of any data from any experiment. So the, the move from observations to theory can't be uh, mechanical in the way that the naive inductivist suggests. As Hempel says, theories are not derived from facts, rather theories are invented in order to account for facts. To, to a large extent, theories involve leaps and guesses often educated guesses, but guesses nonetheless. Developing a theory requires ingenuity. It requires you to think beyond what's given in the data. And hopefully some of the guesses that you make will be, will be lucky ones. But I mean, if you want to have a, a science that's anything like uh, science as it's practiced today, it's clear that, um, you know, th th that our theories need to go beyond observations in some sense. Um, so you don't derive the theory from the observations. Uh, the theory involves more ingenuity and invention than that. So given all these points, um, it, it sort of looks like the naive inductivist has it backwards. We don't make observations and then draw hypotheses. We actually need to start with the hypothesis. And you know, the, the hypothesis then guides further observations. Uh, so Bacon was probably right that this can lead to biases and mistakes, but it's really the only option if you want anything like modern science. The hypothetico-deductive method was designed partially to um, to solve these difficulties in the naive inductivist method, and uh, that's what we'll consider in the next video. But for now, that's all. Thanks for watching.